Hello, I'm Margaret Sneddon, Chair of the British Lymphology Society, one of the coalition partners of the Legs Matter campaign. I'm delighted that um, Professor Peter Mortimer from St George's University Hospital in London is joining today. He is a national and internationally renowned expert in lymphatic disorders, particularly lymphedema. And he's also patron to the BLS charity. And he's joining to discuss lower limb chronic edema and its treatment. So Peter, uh, welcome. Chronic Thank edema you. or swelling that lasts more than three months in the legs and feet is a fairly common symptom of many disorders. Would you just set the scene please about explaining what chronic edema is and why it's so common, why so many people have it? Okay, well, hello everybody. Uh, chronic edema uh, is essentially swelling that's been there for some time. We arbitrarily say three months. And edema is the Greek word for swelling, but it implies that there is fluid buildup within tissue. And it usually affects the foot or the ankle or the leg. Uh, and there's a buildup of fluid. And generally, the public can recognize that as being swelling, fluid swelling, and will often know that because if they push a thumb in, it pits because you're moving fluid out the way, or a sock mark will leave a rim around the, the ankle again because the top of the sock has pushed the fluid away. So that's what edema is. What's not generally appreciated is that all edema, whatever the cause, always involves a problem with the lymph drainage. And the plumbing in relation to edema is fairly simple. The fluid that builds up in the tissue has originated from the blood circulation. So it essentially is, it leaks out or is filtered out from blood vessels percolates through the tissues because the cells within tissues need water and the drainage route out of the tissue is actually down the lymph system. So it's a fairly straightforward in out arrangement and therefore edema arises either because too much fluid is produced from the blood vessels or leaked from the blood vessels into the tissue or insufficient is drained down the lymph system. And there's always a dynamic balance between these two. So for example, uh, it's not unusual for someone in hot weather to say, oh, my ankles swell, or they're on an aeroplane flight sitting for seven hours and they say, my ankles swell under those circumstances, but that's normal. Well, no, it's not normal. What, what the swelling is telling you is that there's more fluid moving into the ankle than is being drained by the lymph system. So the lymph system is therefore not really doing its job properly under those circumstances. Why might that be? Why might there be too much fluid produced or not enough lymph drainage? And the answer is when one's sitting down or, or, or standing still, the veins fill with blood, the pressure rises and more fluid passes from the veins into the tissue. And unless the lymph system responds to that, one gets swelling. If one's sitting or standing still, the movement needed to push the fluid then into the lymph system in a way is not happening because you need activity, movement, exercise to get the lymph system to move. So if I go back to the situation on an aeroplane, you're sitting still with your legs down, the veins are, are filled and fluid is therefore forced out, but you're also not moving. So you're actually not generating the lymph drainage that's needed 
Now, many people would say, well, my feet don't swell or my ankles don't swell. Well, that's probably because you've got a very robust limb system or you are moving more than you think you are fidgeting away because fidgeting is sufficient to get the limb system to move. Um, but anyone who really then gets swelling and gets off an aeroplane and says it takes a day or two for it to recover, then there is definitely an issue with the lymph drainage. Similarly with heat, what heat does is bring blood to the surface near the skin and within the skin. And the more blood there is in the skin, the more fluid that's produced. And the same principle applies. So chronic might, edema is that situation where it persists. Yes. Um, I imagine there's a number of people perhaps experiencing swelling of their feet and ankles through working at home just now, long periods, sitting. Um, no question. At a desk, yes. No question. And indeed, lymphedema patients that I've been seeing with lower limb lymphedema, almost without exception, uh, they've said it's been worse during lockdown. And they've identified the fact that whereas normally they would be walking to work or climbing stairs in the tube or going upstairs at work or moving around more at work, this virtual arrangement means one's often sitting and unless you remember to get up and move around, go and get a cup of tea or coffee or something, you're not moving anything like you would normally do if you were in your office or workplace. So if people are experiencing swelling, the first thing they should think about is they need to move more. But if it persists, then there is an issue that they should see about. Yes, I mean, even even if it doesn't persist, at that moment when the swelling is there, the lymph drainage is clearly not working as well as it should do. Perhaps it's not being stimulated because you've not moved, or perhaps it's less than robust anyway. So anyone then who has uh, a problem with swelling that then doesn't resolve as soon as they get up and move around, it does suggest there's a problem with the lymph drainage. And it may be, I, we, I can't prove this, but I suspect uh, a bit like varicose veins get more common as you get older. Um, so our limp system probably gets weaker as we get older. And if it was weaker, like varicose veins can often start in your teens or early 20s, if your limb system is not as robust then, it may be working okay, but if it's not as robust then as it might be, you're very likely to get a problem of serious lymph drainage issues when you're older. So if someone has um, chronic swelling, if it is persisting for a, a few months, is it lymphedema? Well, that's a good question because I maintain that lymphedema is not really any different from chronic edema. Uh, and the reason is lymphedema implies from the name, you've got edema swelling due to the fact that lymph fluid has built up in the tissue. Well, tissue fluid and lymph, lymph is actually the fluid that is within the lymphatic system. But tissue fluid before it's entered the lymphatic system is not really any different in composition. They're, they're the same. So it is not, it's physiologically correct to say there's not really any strict difference between lymphedema and chronic edema because both involve a failure of lymph drainage. Um, but uh, strictly speaking, lymphedema has always been thought of as an edema where the only issue uh, is an obstructed lymph drainage. Well, uh, life's not as simple as that. And it comes back to this dynamic change. So even patients who do have obstructed lymph drainage, their swelling will vary because of the amount of new lymph fluid that's being produced. And their lymph drainage will vary to some extent, depending on their activity and what they're doing. So. Um, I don't think there's any much difference between chronic edema and lymphedema. Chronic edema is recognized. It's a physical sign. Lymphedema is strictly a diagnosis or a disease. 
Uh, doctors, generally speaking, will always recognize chronic edema, but they won't think <laughs> of lymphedema. They'll think lymphedema is rare, or you only get lymphedema when you've had breast cancer treatment and lymph glands removed. Well, that's not so at all. It's, as I've said, physiologically, you can argue there's no difference between chronic edema and lymphedema. They, they both produce the same levels of infection complication uh, because the lymph system is important for preventing and fighting infection. And chronic edema, the infection rates in chronic edema are just as high as they are in lymphedema. And basically the treatment is exactly the same. So it's much simpler, much simpler to think of them as the same problem and deal with them in the same way. We'll come back to how they are treated, um, but can you say a little first about what else might cause the extra fluid to be produced that puts that burden on the um, lymph system? Okay, so uh, going back to the very simple plumbing arrangement, so uh, fluid is produced from the blood circulation let's say the veins, although it's strictly the smaller little blood vessels, the capillaries. That's where fluid originates from to get into the tissue and it drains then by the lymph system. So what produces more fluid to be released from the blood circulation into the tissue and that fluid is basically becomes lymph. So we can talk about this release of fluid is the lymph load. It's the supply that becomes the lymph. And anything that makes the blood vessels uh, release fluid, that may be, as I mentioned already, higher pressure. So there's more of a, a hydraulic or water pressure in the veins, such as you get in with varicose veins, and also with heart failure, that increases the pressure within the veins. Um, equally, <coughs> excuse me, the veins or the blood vessels may be inflamed and they become more leaky. So that if there's a dermatitis and inflammation of the skin, then that can release more fluid. And also if there is um, more a lower protein in the blood, then that too can uh, mean that more fluid is released. That's a really good explanation about um, what chronic edema is. Peter, thank you very much. Um, before we talk about um, treatments, it might be worth saying something about other causes of lymphedema and chronic edema, um, such as heart failure. Yes, well, Returning to that same theme of fluid movement into tissue and out of tissue by the uh, lymphatic system. While true lymphedema is undoubtedly caused by a dominant fault with lymph drainage, in all forms of chronic edema and lymphedema, there's a constant balancing act between in and out. And the in is the fluid in, and therefore the lymph load, which then passes through the tissue and drains down the lymph system, as we've been saying. Now, there are lots of different causes of increased lymph load, heart failure being one of them. And in heart failure, what happens is because the heart doesn't pump very efficiently. There's a buildup of blood in the veins trying to access the heart and that higher pressure in the veins is conducted down into the legs and the higher pressure forces fluid out from the veins and small little blood vessels into the tissue. The same will happen with varicose veins where the pressure is higher when you're standing and other situations where the vein flow may be obstructed. So following a DVT, what we call post-thrombotic syndrome, or if there's actually venous obstruction somewhere in the pelvis. So all those causes will rise, will increase venous pressure and force fluid into the tissues. But other 
factors that will increase lymph load and fluid moving into the tissue from the blood circulation would include inflammation. So uh, inflammation in relation to the skin or sometimes joints, arthritis, will also increase the lymph load. And then finally, there are circumstances where if the protein levels in the blood drop, because protein in the blood holds water in the circulation, if the protein levels drop, then more fluid will leak out. And that can happen in certain forms of kidney disease. It's worth saying that everyone thinks uh, edema is a sign of uh, kidney disease, and it's actually not, uh, except in very late kidney disease, advanced kidney disease, or a condition called nephrotic syndrome, which is when the kidney loses a lot of protein. So there are actually quite a lot of causes uh, that increase the amount of lymph produced in the tissue. And then of course, it depends on the lymph system as to whether it can drain it away. And often that lymph system will not succeed in doing that or at least if it does for a period of time, eventually the lymph system becomes exhausted and becomes permanently reduced in its capacity so that even if the causes of the height and lymph load drop, the lymph system is now uh, permanently damaged. So you've, you've still got a chronic edema, lymphedema situation. One other um, cause that people often come across is um, drugs that seem to make the body more prone to retain fluid. Well, drugs can work in different ways. They can either increase the lymph production or they can interfere with the lymph drainage. Now, one drug in particular is well recognized for causing chronic edema. And that's the, uh, the treatment for blood pressure. We call it calcium channel antagonists or calcium channel blockers. And calcium channels are very important to make lymph vessels contract. So if you block that process, then the lymphatics will not pump as well. But that class of drug also reduces blood pressure by interfering with the blood circulation and actually improving, or not improving, increasing lymph drainage. So actually you've got a bit of a double whammy with that class of drug, which is why edema is so, so common. Uh, there are probably other drugs. There's a long list of drugs that we're uh, realizing can contribute to chronic edema but most of them will increase fluid retention. I mean, steroids are the obvious example. So by retaining fluid, salt and water in the body, they increase the fluid drainage, the, the fluid load, and again, make the lymph system struggle. So one has to constantly look at medication of patients if one's gonna manage chronic edema and lymphedema properly. But is it usually possible to change those drugs? Yes. I mean, unfortunately, uh, calcium channel antagonists, and particularly amlodipine, uh, are first-line treatment for hypertension, for high blood pressure. But there are so many drugs available now for treating hypertension that it really shouldn't be a problem. It's just that many GPs are reluctant to move off a guideline when they feel that the blood pressure is more important than the chronic edema, but actually you can manage both perfectly well with alternative medication. So whatever the cause of chronic edema, even though it's treated, we often have to treat the chronic edema itself. But um, if someone has um, swelling on top of all these problems, it is worth talking to the GP to see if some of the medication might be contributing and might be easily changed. Yes, and certainly the uh, calcium channel antagonists, I think are the one group 
uh, that are important. I mean, there are others, for example, there are some of the new diabetic drugs and some of the new Parkinson's disease drugs that uh, increase edema. But quite honestly, they're so valuable for the management of the Parkinson's, you have to do a benefit risk ratio there. And it may be you have to manage the edema due to the drug rather than stop the drug. Okay. Um, that's probably a good place to say something about how we treat chronic edema. What are the important things as part of that treatment? Well, management of chronic edema and lymphedema uh, is the same. And the reason it's the same is because you have to consider the in-out balance of fluid. So you have to look at possible causes of increased fluid production, and you have to look at causes of reduced fluid drainage, namely lymph drainage. So it doesn't matter whether you're talking about chronic edema or lymphedema, the treatment is going to be the same. And that treatment will therefore be to uh, reduce any increased lymph load and to improve lymph drainage. And the improvement in lymph drainage is going to be along the lines that we know. In other words, movement and activity are the number one requirement for stimulating movement of fluid both into and along uh, lymph conducting pathways. Uh, the use of compression aids that process. And the reason compression works on improving lymph drainage is because it increases the pressure within the tissue so that when muscles contract, there's a greater uh, change in the uh, pressure, tissue pressures. So they go higher and then reduce lower during rest. So muscle activity causes a greater force to move fluid from the tissue into and along the lymph drainage. And that's why uh, in anyone with chronic edema, even if they've got a degree of heart failure, you're going to want to control the heart failure situation, but you're also going to want to improve the lymph drainage. And what about the skin? Because you mentioned um, about inflammatory conditions of the skin. Well, inflammation, any form of inflammation, causes firstly an increase in blood flow and secondly an increase in what's called vascular permeability. That means the ability of the blood vessels to leak fluid. And so uh, that increases lymph load. So you want to reduce inflammation if you're going to uh, control chronic edema. And that inflammation may be, as I've said, because of uh, inflammatory skin diseases, uh, particularly on the lower legs. If, if the legs are inflamed uh, because of dermatitis, then that's going to increase the lymph load and make the lymph system struggle to drain that fluid. So treatment of inflammatory skin disease is very important if you want to uh, control chronic edema. And um, things like wounds or ulcers that are common in the lower limb um, sometimes take a long time to heal. That would um, also have an effect? Yes. If you take venous leg ulcers, for example, which we recognise as caused by the high venous pressures then uh, interfering with the viability of the tissues in the lower leg, particularly around the ankle. The lymph system is inevitably involved in that process to the extent that the edema that you see and invariably see with a venous ulcer or a wound on the lower leg will be due to the lymph system not working as well as it should do to remove that fluid and a buildup of lymph around a wound will impair that wound healing. So much as treatment is designed to reduce venous pressures, the treatment actually in terms of movement and exercise and bandaging also improves lymph drainage. And although it's difficult to provide the evidence, I don't think there's any doubt that improving lymph drainage aids wound healing. So it's important not to delay treatment to um, 
give the patient advice about looking after their skin and movement, but also applying compression at as early a stage as possible? Yes, uh, we've said that uh, early mild chronic edema is not normal. And in fact, uh, mild chronic edema is likely only to get worse if you don't address it. And if it gets worse, then that changes the skin, it changes the viability of the tissue, it increases the risk of infection. So it, one can't intervene too early as, in terms of the management of any uh, chronic edema. And as we've said, that's going to be through the uh, means of improving lymph drainage, which is going to be activity, movement, exercise, with compression aiding the process of lymph drainage during exercise. Uh, I'm aware that some um, nurses are a bit um, a bit nervous about applying compression to some lower limbs because they fear of causing ischemia and other problems. But um, in fact, more harm might be done by not applying compression at an early stage. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, uh, the, the, uh, it's important to know that the arterial circulation is sound if you're going to put compression on a leg. And, and this principle arose during the treatment of uh, venous leg ulcers, where poor arterial circulation often coexisted. So the measurement of a Doppler pressure, which simply means the arterial pressure or within the uh, leg, needs to be measured to ensure that, it, that you can safely put a, a, a compression bandage on. Uh, so we've adopted that rule to some extent in the management of lymphedema, but quite honestly, uh, the risk of uh, arterial disease uh, in someone with lymphedema is actually very much lower. And uh, I've never seen a problem of putting a bandage on a lymphedema leg and causing a difficulty with the circulation. Whereas compression bandaging in lymphedema can sometimes damage local nerves. So it's one has to be alert to skin integrity and to make sure that the patient's not experiencing any numbness as a result of the compression. In my experience, that's more common problem than compromising the arterial circulation. But nevertheless, I think to do a Doppler once for reassurance is important, but it doesn't need to be repeated uh, on a regular basis. And there are, um, it is possible to um, assess the, uh, the limb and the blood flow clinically. And I know that the British Lymphology Society has a, um, a guidance tool that people can use to ensure that there's safety in their clinical judgment in many cases where it's maybe not possible to um, have a Doppler test or to get a Doppler reading? Yes, um, in my view, uh, actually skin blood flow uh, is actually a better guide than taking a blood pressure in the leg. And what I do is uh, in the lower limb, I elevate the leg empty the veins, so by putting the foot above heart level, uh, and then look at the uh, tip of the toe and press it to uh, get rid of the blood, make it blanch, and see how quickly the blood flows back in again. Mm -hmm. And if it flows back in in just a few seconds with the foot elevated, <laughs> there's not a problem um, uh, with, the, with the arterial blood flow. And indeed, that may be a better measure because in diabetics, taking uh, an arterial blood pressure measurement in the lower leg is very unreliable. So it's actually in theory better to look at the tissue blood flow, such as the pulp of, a, of the big toe. Okay. Um, so that's how a professional would treat um, chronic edema but there's lots of things that people can do for themselves. And you've mentioned um, the importance of movement and being active, regularly moving about, not sitting in the one place. And we also mentioned skin care. 
So looking after your skin, cleansing every day, moisturizing, to try and keep that um, nice and supple and not get cracked and dry as often happens in chronic edema. Um, is that right? Yes, yes. Skin care is important because the skin is the outer covering which protects you really from the environment and keeps fluid <clears throat> and other materials in the tissue so the tissues are well hydrated and healthy. Um, and if the skin then dries out, cracks or develops wounds, then the underlying tissue is more vulnerable, particularly to infection. So skin care is very important, um, as would be um, management of the edema. And one of the problems, particularly in the elderly, is that uh, sitting becomes the standard position. And sitting is in many ways the worst position for lymph drainage because uh, the veins fill, the fluid load becomes high, but there's no movement to generate lymph drainage. At least when one's standing, one's using more muscle power to control balance and what have you, which will increase the lymph drainage. So um, sitting, long period sitting, and, and I say to patients, the worst thing you can do is to fall asleep in a chair with your legs down. And I think that's because when you're asleep, there's no movement at all. You don't even get muscle twitches, which to some extent can improve lymph drainage. So sleeping in a chair is a disaster for the management of chronic edema. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think um, some people don't go to bed at, at all. They sometimes sleep in a reclining chair, but it's uh, important that any effort is made to enable them to get to bed. Yes, I mean, a reclining chair is not as good as bed, but it's certainly a lot better than sleeping with your legs down. And the reason for that is mainly because once, when you've elevated your legs, um, the veins collapse. And so the pressure in the veins reduces and less fluid, less lymph is formed. Uh, but it's important really that the legs are at heart level, other than what, otherwise the veins don't uh, collapse properly. Okay, um, thanks very much. I think you've covered most things um, and lots of the causes that, that might commonly cause um, chronic edema um, from things that people think are normal um, in a long haul flight to conditions, but whatever, it's important to address the chronic edema as well as whatever the cause is. Absolutely. And there are lots of people can do for themselves, but they the one thing they should not ignore it. They should always seek some help and um, not let it go on and on. That's Absolutely. I think too, there's a lot that people can do for themselves. Uh, we've just talked about movement and activity because that's good for lymph drainage. And of course, the other thing we have touched upon is, is weight control, because we know that uh, being overweight impairs lymphatic function. That's proven. We don't exactly know how it does it, but we know it impairs lymphatic function. Uh, and if you add to that, again, uh, people who have a large abdominal girth, so they really are quite overweight, and when they're sitting, that, ab that abdomen often sits on the thighs and can then further obstructs both the drainage within the veins and the drainage within the lymph system uh, up through the groin uh, and back up towards the heart. So uh, an obese uh, patient sitting for long periods, there are lots of reasons why they get chronic edema. Uh, and so weight control, as well as movement and activity, uh, is important for the management of uh, chronic edema. Thanks very much. Um, we'll close now, but just wanted to remind everyone that there is a lot more information about all the conditions that we've touched on today and how people can help themselves on the Legs Matter website. Thank you very much.
Peter, there's a few questions um, come up on the chat during that. Um, one was about um, foot massagers, the, the gadgets that you can buy if someone's sitting all day long and they've got swollen legs and ankles, do they help? Yes, I mean, again, the principle of any movement helps is the answer to this. So uh, I'm not quite sure what foot massage gadgets, there are all sorts of things. I mean, the, I suppose the one that's most known is a circulation booster, but I've no idea really how that works at all. But anything that creates movement is essentially going to be good for lymph drainage, even if you're sitting. Um, what I often say to patients, uh, if they are working at the computer for long periods of time, then it's often worthwhile getting something like a desk pedal. So not only is it is, whereas the foot gadgets, I think just often vibrate or just move a little, only slightly. Whereas if you use a desk pedal, you are actually simulating a sort of cycling or even walking uh, movement. And I would think that that's better, but we don't actually know. But in in theory, it ought to be better than something that you just plant your feet on and sit like that while it vibrates or whatever they do. Yeah, I think if I could add to that, um, my worry would be that people would feel that was enough, that they're getting their movement. And it's even if they're very limited, any movement they can generate themselves with um, stretching their ankles, stretching their toes out is going to be better than sitting on a vibrating machine. Totally agree. Myself. Totally, totally agree. Yeah. Um, okay. Somebody has um, said about their own situation about they were referred, they, ha they had lymph edema uh, diagnosed in 1963 at puberty. 2019, are you seeing these, Peter? Yes, I can see Diagnosed that. by a lymph a lymphedema nurses having primary lymphedema. Uh, so yes. My state salvation comes from a passionate instructor and close-knit exercise group. Other than compression garments measured six monthly, I have no medical input. Then question, um, I find I've only one kidney. Does that work against me? Well, uh, this question i don't know whether i presume everyone can see the question posted in the uh yeah. chat area um so lymphedema starting out of the blue at or around puberty strongly suggests a primary lymphedema problem uh, and by primary lymphedema i mean an inherent or inborn fault in the lymph system that was hitherto unknown and there's something about puberty that can then express or expose uh, that inborn weakness to manifest with the lymphedema swelling. And so that was back in 1963. And then the patient comes right up to 2019, um, uh, diagnosed by lymphedema nurse having primary lymphedema. And then fat people have two fat legs, not a fat leg and a thin leg. Well, I think that's just referring to the fact that uh, lymphedema causes swelling and uh, swelling can be fat. It can be fluid. Uh, it can be all manner of things that causes swelling. But if you've got one uh, in inverted commas fat leg and one thin leg, then that's very likely to be a, a lymph drainage problem. Uh, and the patients implying that apart from compression garments they have there's no other treatment well that's not strictly true but as we've been mentioning it's all about exercise while wearing compression that's the key factor it's not the compression so compression is not trying to squeeze fluid out of a leg like that you might squeeze water out of a wet towel as you put it through a mangle um, but it's about trying to get the muscle pumps to work better. And the, and I, I think lymph drainage would be enhanced three, possibly four fold if you're exercising with a compression garment on as opposed to no compression garment. The other question this, pay, this person mentions is uh, 
uh, I only have one kidney, does that work against me? No, if that one kidney is perfectly functional, then there's no problem at all. And it shouldn't have any impact at all on lymphedema. And finally, can lymphedema have a part in incontinence? Well, the only link I can think of, because incontinence is implying uh, an involuntary leakage of, let's say, urine. And what can often happen is if there's lymphedema that's involving the genitalia to the point that lymph fluid leaks out of the genitalia, that can be perceived as exactly the same as incontinence. Um, but lymphedema per se does not cause incontinence. There's another one here about um, seeing people being prescribed diuretics to treat the demo occasionally, but am I right that it, this isn't appropriate? Uh, in general, yes, it is inappropriate. And the reason for that is that diuretics lose salt and water from the body. They do not improve lymph drainage. So if the majority or the, the sole fault uh, is a poor lymph drainage, then diuretics will not do anything for that. And patients uh, will often agree, they'll find that out. I mean, uh, GPs, if they see chronic edema, uh, they will um, prescribe a diuretic. Um, and that's not an unreasonable approach for a short term trial of treatment. But if the uh, um, and diuretics, for example, would be the right treatment for heart failure. Um, but <coughs> excuse me, if it's given for lymphedema and there's no effect really within a week, then there's no point whatsoever continuing with it. Uh, but unfortunately, some doctors just persevere and say, oh, no, keep taking the water tablets. But uh, the patient often knows best in these situations and will know that it's not doing anything and it's not improving lymph drainage. So there's no point in continuing. I will just add that there are one or two occasions where we see in a lymphedema patient, there is a widespread lymph problem. So there may be issues of lymph fluid buildup within and around the abdominal organs, for example. And because we can't put bandages or easily use massage or other measures, we then sometimes by default will use a small amount of diuretic just to restrict salt and water in the in the body. But it's in principle, it's not the right treatment for lymphedema. Okay. There's another question about um, in someone who is very obese with the large abdomen resting the thighs, would that type of person need a stronger compression to manage chronic edema? Where's that one? I can't see that one. Um, what time was it? It's after the one of the diuretics. Oh, it's immediately afterwards. Yes. Um, uh, well, when they so the with that type of person who's obese with a large abdominal girth that sits on their thighs, would they need a strong compression to manage their chronic edema, presumably in the legs? Um, well, I suppose the answer to that is yes, but. <laughs> I think the important thing is to address the large abdomen rather than just rack up the pressure on the legs, quite honestly. So um, I think under those circumstances, you have to address the obesity and that needs medical input. I mean, the patient may be able to do a lot for themselves, but sometimes you need either a medical bariatric treatment or even a surgical bariatric treatment if the BMI is well over 40. I think um, this, it's a useful comment that somebody's made about the tailored exercise and just giving them their life back. I think it's, it's very true. It's such an important part of managing chronic edema. Yes, because one needs to remember that uh, exercise, if it's very vigorous and really stresses the muscles, will actually require more uh, blood flow and oxygen to those muscles and to the tissues in general, so that the greater inflow of blood and fluid can, at least temporarily, make swelling worse. 
So tailored exercise would also, in my view, mean optimal exercise to improve lymph drainage without necessarily increasing blood flow. Um, so pa patients would say, I'm going to run a marathon. Is that wise because of my lymphedema? And I say, well, if you go out tomorrow and just try and do 26 miles, your leg will swell more. Um, but if you then go back and, and, and practice and basically train for that uh, yeah. marathon, then there's no reason why you can't run a marathon while wearing uh, compression. And under those circumstances, I think it's also worth men mentioning that uh, lymphedema therapists use a lot of what I call day wear medical compression garments. But there is now a huge industry involving athletic compression, some of which is very good indeed. And furthermore, it's quite fashionable. So I'm often recommending a mixture of athletic compression when one's in the gym or exercising, but then wear your medical compression garments for day wear for the rest of the time. Okay, that's Peter. Okay, there's another one asking about the difference between lymphedema and lipoedema and if they're both treated the same with compression. Yes, well, the difference between lymphedema and lipoedema, I, I come back to the names themselves. Uh, lymphedema, uh, I mean, we've said edema means swelling. It's the Greek word for swelling. And if it's lymphedema, it implies that lymph fluid is accumulating in the tissue to give rise to the swelling. Um, whereas lipoedema, lip is the word for fat. So it implies that the swelling is solely due to fat. And lipoedema is specifically when you get uh, swollen fat legs, usually with minimal or no fluid component to them as part of an inherited or certainly genetic condition uh, where they're programmed to put extra fat on the legs. So there is quite a difference between the two as to whether there's a lymph problem underlying lipoedema, that's, that's a difficult one to answer. And I pose that um, because a lot of lipoedema patients who would simply have a disproportionately big fat legs, possibly from puberty, they can go on to develop lymphoedema later in life, implying that there may be a lymph drainage issue uh, from the word go with lipoedema, but we do not know. So the answer, the difference is lymphoedema usually has a fluid component and lipoedema strictly is a fat swelling with minimal or no fluid. Uh, are they treated the same? Well, we do use compression with lipoedema because there is often a, a fluid element to it. So that's one thing we know we can control. The fat side of it is more difficult mm -hmm. and will often be, uh, if the patient's not overweight, one can use liposuction, non-cosmetic liposuction, um, and because you can't compress fat. But that's the only difference between the two. Okay, there's uh, someone just commenting about the frequency with which GPs often don't diagnose chronic edema, lymphedema, and put it down to aging, put people in diuretics. Um, how can we improve this situation, improve the management? Where are you looking at? Where's that one? It's um, after the one about lipoedema and lymphedema, 20 or two. If you take a look in the Q&A, you should see a button at the bottom of the screen with Q&A with a little four in it. Um, there's four questions in there, and I think All that's right. one of the ones that Margaret has read out. I can't see a four. Where is it? Um, along the bottom of the screen. Can you Q &A. see a share screen, record, raise hand, Q&A? Oh, I see. Yes, yeah, sorry, that has all disappeared. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, so taking that question about GPs often don't diagnose chronic edema, lymphedema and put the swelling down to age. Uh, patients are often put on diuretics with no effect at all, and this just increases misery for people. Uh, how can we improve the situation? Well, we improve the situation by educating GPs and we can, and I wouldn't put the blame totally on GPs. I'd put it on 
pretty well all healthcare professionals that have not been adequately taught about the lymphatic system and lymphedema. Uh, it's true to say that, and we've alluded to this already, swelling does deteriorate in age with age so that lymphedema is much more common the older you get. Um, and as I said earlier, in the same way that varicose veins tend to get worse as you get older, so lymphedema tends to get worse as you get older or even manifest when you're older, even though the problem may have existed uh, earlier in life. We've also answered the diuretic thing, saying diuretics do not strictly help lymphedema unless the lymphedema has other factors uh, like uh, increased salt and water retention from heart failure or whatever it happens to be, in which case diuretics are helpful. Um, and the diuretics, if tried, should be short term. It's very easy to find out if the diuretics are going to be helpful or not. Uh, you will know in a week or two and the GP should, know, should be taught to say, look, we'll try this for two weeks. If it doesn't do anything, we'll stop it. You don't just continuing with them. Um, and as I've said, how can we improve the situation for patients? Well, it's got to be education for all healthcare professionals, and that's going to start in basic uh, training. Uh, and hopefully the lymph system will become a greater part of curriculums, but it doesn't really exist within medical, nursing, physio, uh, podiatry, pharmacy, curriculum teaching, and it needs to have a much bigger part uh, in, in teaching and then uh, patients will get a better deal uh, from their professionals. Uh, the same person asking about prediction for the future. Um, they mean lymphedema, do they? Um, well, the fact that it's increasing. They mean it's increasing because of obesity. Lymphedema. Well, I think it's increasing and it certainly has done during lockdown because of of less activity and greater weight gain. And I think that's why certainly the lymphedema patients I've seen have got worse uh, during the lockdown period or during the pandemic period. And no doubt uh, people who didn't really have much of a problem beforehand now have a problem. And a classic example, uh, and we've alluded to this al already, is the office commuter who would actually get quite a bit of exercise by walking to the bus, getting onto the bus, getting off the bus, going to the tube, walking up the escalator, walking up the stairs, walking into the office, going up the stairs in the office, da -de da Whereas now they're sitting for possibly eight hours without very with very little movement at their computer at home and the situation is made even worse if they've got that big abdominal girth and uh, they're managing just to um, eat inappropriately while they're working at home so i think they're the reasons things have got worse certainly over the last two years um, and it's a common problem uh, uh, Christine Moffat, who's done very good epidemiology studies for chronic edema, has shown worldwide that it's a very, very common problem, particularly in the elderly. So you're right, there are a lot of people out there with swollen legs, swollen ankles, and um, very little is done about it because it, the diagnosis is not made. It's also made more difficult for GPs when we don't have... Uh, a variety of treatments to offer. I mean, it would be fine if every street had their own lymphedema therapist, but there are very few lymphedema therapists around. And indeed that number is declining. So actually, if a G, even if a GP recognizes the lymphedema, um, there may be nobody in their catchment area to whom they can refer that patient. And that's a worry. And that's obviously something that British Lymphology Society needs to sort of do as much as they can to raise awareness and say this is a problem, a problem that's getting worse. And if patients with swollen legs are not treated properly, they don't walk as well, they don't move as well, uh, they can't get their shoes on, uh, 
they are at risk of infection and if they get cellulitis they can get septic uh, and be very very sick so it is serious it needs addressing but uh, as i've said in many um, ccgs in the catchment areas the expertise for treating swollen legs is limited to say the to say the least i think though there is an important place for associations uh, for the british lymphology society and legs matter who can um help all of us all the public understand about the importance of it and about not ignoring it and going to seek help um early on before it gets you know to the more difficult to treat stage um, so the more that that gets out there, the better. And there's lots and lots of resources on both uh, websites. Sure. Um, yeah, we want to go on to the next one, which is about the COVID-19 vaccine, the yeah, very topical this, one. This is, I, I don't want to be too negative here, but this is a very complicated medical story here. And it's impossible really to answer it properly under these circumstances. All I would say is that if you have four limb lymphedema, that means both arms and both legs affected with lymphedema, uh, and that's likely to be uh, a, a, a genetic uh, uh, problem, then uh, the question I'm usually asked is where should I have the vaccine injection? Um, and the answer is in the least swollen limb. Uh, enlarged lymph nodes are a normal side effect of a vaccination. Uh, there seems to be a lot of alarm about having enlarged lymph glands, but actually it's a good sign. It means that the vaccine has accessed your lymph system, got to the lymph nodes, and there is a very good immune response to the vaccine. So never be worried about in lymph and large lymph glands uh, in response to uh, vaccination. Uh, and if you feel yourself uh, vulnerable because of your lymphedema, in my view, there's even more reason to have the COVID-19 vaccine, because if you get COVID infection, you're likely to be at much more danger than if you than from the vaccine. So have the vaccination. Thanks, Peter. Um, another question about do light compression socks help with mild edema? I wear brightly coloured ones daily now and then and they seem to be helping and walk daily. I think the answer is yes, they do. Yes. If you've got mild edema, then mild compression can often work. I mentioned about athletic compression, which is a, a product range that's improved considerably in the last oh, five years, probably 10 years. And of course, it's fashionable, but athletic compression uh, in the form of baloney socks, leggings, um, the sort of kit that people wear in the gym uh, often provides a degree of compression. So the combination of the light compression and the exercise taken while wearing it is often very, very good uh, for lymph drainage. So the answer, yes, light compression socks can help with mild edema, uh, providing you move. Okay, thanks, Peter. And then um, someone saying that been unable to get a GP appointment, but wants to use compression socks. Well, I think if you've not had a medical assessment, then the answer would be to start with a low level of compression. And although medics, um, uh, healthcare professionals will often talk about class one, class two, class three, uh, I think the answer, I come back to the athletic compression, which they're available online. Uh, and I would start with the lowest compression. Uh, I'm not sure that the athletic compression offers a range of compression. I think they're all fairly low, but might vary somewhat between uh, manufacturers. And usually you're looking at something like around 22 millimetres of mercury. Well, possibly, no, probably less than that, actually, uh, with athletic compression, something like 18 to 22 millimetres of mercury at the ankle. Uh, but the greatest problem is usually getting the right fit, because what you don't want 
is socks that fall down or tourniquet or ruckle um, and therefore getting a fit in my view is probably more important than worrying too much about the compression uh, but you should start with low compression and make sure you get a good fit our pharmacies are usually pretty good at this pharmacists are trained to measure for compression garments and therefore you should be able to go in to your pharmacy and ask about compression socks this is this is not we're not talking about flight socks here flight socks you might pick up at the airport are largely designed to last for one flight and then disintegrate you're talking about something that sh a product that should last for some months and the pharmacist should be trained to measure you and choose the product for you so i would actually suggest you go to the pharmacist uh, rather than your gp i think that I, that's um it can be variable, um, Peter, and we are doing some work with the pharmacists at the moment because they recognise that they need a better understanding of it. But I think they are a good point of contact to ask about this, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, they may, some pharmacists will not be trained and will not know, but they should do, and you might get a better hearing than you might do with respect from a busy GP. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if there's any other questions. It's probably uh, we're about our finishing it's time. Maybe one or two just in the chat now. Okay. Yeah, I've on five, but I can't see them. I think we've answered uh, them. Someone who has a sequential compressor, Big Bertha, who does definitely help. However, I am lucky and can afford this form of relief. Mm. Where's that? It's that's in the chat, Peter, rather than the Q&A. Right, OK. Oh, is it? OK, it's, it's, there's a lot of comments rather than questions. Sure. Very positive. Good. Oh, I see. Sequential compressor. I just found it. Yes, that's that's basically intermittent pneumatic compression therapy that for those unfamiliar with that it's a basically an inflatable boot that will go that will fit over the leg you zip it up and connect it to a pump and it inflates and deflates and it may have multiple chambers within the more chambers then the more a massaging effect can be uh, administered to the leg and i think that's what the big bertha uh, is and that can help uh, I particularly recommend them um, when patients do have struggle with their movement otherwise I would say go out and move rather than uh, sit down or lie with a machine on you but if your movements in difficulty then I think these pneumatic compression machines can be helpful but they're not prescribable as the person's referring to. They're, the GP can't prescribe them, they have to be purchased. But many of the companies will allow a trial period to see if they're helpful, and if they're helpful, then you've got the opportunity of buying them. Okay, there's one more question, uh, Peter. Can you wear light compression socks every day for mild edema if you're walking and moving lots? Well, I wear light compression every day and I don't have any edema and I've worn light compression socks for 30 years. Ever since I went to see somebody called Michael Foldy in the Foldy Clinic in Germany, who was the first person to develop the modern techniques for treating lymphedema. And I went to see him in about 1984 and he had compression socks on and he said, I wear them because I know they're they're working and helping with my lymph drainage, not because I've got a problem with edema. And I expect this to prevent edema in the future. So from that moment forth, I started wearing compression socks. It also has the advantage that in clinic, I can hoist up my trouser leg and show the patient I wear them. So if I can wear them, you can gen obviously wear them. I think that's probably the end of the, the questions. Um, so I'd like to thank 
to Peter, but also thank the people um, who are in the chat and talking about what they're going to do, passing information on. So there is lots available um, on the Legs Matter site uh, and specifically on lymphedema and the British Neurologist site. Um, so I think thank you very much to everybody and thank you, Peter. Nice and um, do look at some of the other sessions on Legs Matter for lots of different topics and um, I'm sure you'll find them very helpful. Okay, thanks.